This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and holding. We're in the final hours of the STS-32 launch countdown at this time. Everything is proceeding smoothly here in the firing room at the launch control center. We've got a full 10 day mission planned for this flight. Primary objective of, is to deploy the CENCOM satellite, retrieve the long duration exposure facility, and to demonstrate the capability of modifications for an extended mission duration. And we've got the STS-32 flight crew again this morning for breakfast. Mission Specialist Marsha Ivins making her first trip into space today. Mission Specialist Bonnie Dunbar making her second trip into space. And Commander Dan Brandenstein. This will be his third flight, his second one to command. There's pilot uh, James Weatherby and Mission Specialist David Lowe. We've now joined the STS-32 flight crew in the operations and checkout building. They're getting into their flight suits once again today. Commander Dan Brandenstein. Being, all flight crew members being assisted with the gear that they have to wear on the launch today. It's mission Specialist Bonnie Dunbar. Mission Specialist Marsha Ivins getting her headgear on and uh, Mission Specialist David Lowe. And we've got the flight crew, Commander Dan Brandenstein, Mission Specialist Bonnie Dunbar, Pilot James Weatherby leading the crew out of the side door there. We've got uh, the other two mission specialists, Marsha Ivins and David Lowe. Being greeted by Kennedy Space Center employees, and we're wishing them well for today's flight. And the crew, once again, making a trip to pad 39A. Today, I'm looking at uh, favorable weather conditions for a launch attempt. Flight crew now at the white room at launch pad 39A. Commander Dan Brandenstein is being assisted now with the rest of his gear before boarding the orbiter Columbia. Coming up on retraction of the orbiter access arm. This arm can be extended in just a few seconds if necessary. Engines now being gimbaled will be put in the ready to start position. The 
Now retracting the gaseous oxygen vent hood away from the vehicle, back to the launch position. And caution warning, memory is cleared. Copy, and flight clip crew, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow and have a good flight. T-minus 31 seconds. Go for auto sequence start. We have a go for auto sequence start. Columbia's four redundant computers have primary control of critical vehicle functions for the remainder of the count. T minus 20. T minus 15. T minus 10. 9. We have a go for main engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero, booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia. A new booster decade control, of spaceflight begins. Houston, from the tower, hand over to Houston complete. Roll program initiated. Roger roll, Columbia. Good roll confirmed as Columbia heads out on the uh, proper launch azimuth for the race to catch LDEP. Now throttling down through 102% for the passage through maximum dynamic pressure. They'll take the engines down to 65%. Three good APUs, three good fuel cells. Now throttling back up, three at 104. Columbia, go with throttle up. Roger, Houston, go with throttle up. Now 12 nautical miles downrange, velocity 3,200 feet per second. Three good main engines, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. 15 nautical miles downrange now. Standing by for SRB staging. Now at 4,400 feet per second, 40 miles downrange, performance nominal. Columbia, performance nominal. Roger, Houston, nominal performance. Okay, Jim, what you're looking at right now is uh, the CENTCOM satellite. That's, uh, that's an acronym that stands for Synchronous Communications. It's uh, built by the Hughes Communications Services Incorporated um, for the United States Navy. It's actually leased to the United States Navy for communications in uh, the UHF frequency with uh, its worldwide fleet. You can see it coming out of the payload bay right now, um, rotating at about 1.7 RPM and translating away at about, um, about 1.5 feet per second. It was held in the bay by a cradle. Um, in the cradle, we had four pins that we released one by one. And then finally, at deploy time, we had a, um, a pyrotechnic device that pushed it away uh, with the, the pyro device fired and the uh, spring pushed it away at about 1.7 RPM. In this picture here, uh, this is about 80 seconds into the deploy, and the Omni antenna you can see deploying at this time. Um, as you can see, this spacecraft is actually deployed out of the payload bay when the payload bay is facing the Earth.
Morning, Columbia. Good morning, Earth. We thought you'd appreciate a little Bing Crosby to wake up to this morning. It was wonderful. Okay, we're just starting to get it. Okay, and you've got the Hunsap on the left and the water coming out on the right. Roger that. What you can see, well, you probably can't see it very well on TV, but right along the leading edge here, starting about where the light is now, the uh, water comes up about a quarter of the way, just a little bit below where the floor line now is, and it goes back over here, and here it comes up to about the floor line. It's just a sheet of water, as you indicated, it was like on 27 on the front. Around the end here, we can't see anything, but on the back side, there's a, a little ridge along the bottom, and you can just see that there's just uh, some water there. Looking down into the bilges, Every once in a while you can see a little glob of water down there, and until we get this out, it's going to be kind of hard to tell because we can't get that good a view down past this canister right now. Columbia, Houston, we can't tell very well from the video what you're seeing. Can you give us a little bit of a description of what, what you got in the bills? Okay, Frank. Uh I'll kind of start uh, on the, the water tank up here. There are a few globules. And on the side of the wet trash storage, there's one big glob. And then down along the side of the wet storage, there's some more. Then on the, the deck and the, along these cables, there's some big globs. And then also on the hum step, uh, there's some big globs. A grand total probably of uh, a quart. If you probably summed it all up, and that's a pretty rough guess, probably. Dave Low, David Low, daylight come and it's time to wake up. Dave Low, David Low, daylight come and it's time to get up. Come, are you astronauts sleeping in the cabin? Daylight, come on, it's time to wake up. Time to get out of your bed and your pajamas. Daylight, come on, it's time to get up. Good morning, Columbia. We like the wake-up music so much today, we thought we'd play it for you twice. Good morning, Houston, man. We be up. Columbia, Houston. We have a tally-ho on LDEF, and it looks even better than the SMS visuals.
course, as you know, the dynamics when I started to back away there and get a lot of motion. And I had to stay in course so I could rotate around. Otherwise, it would have taken uh, too long. I think it would have had to back away too far. Uh, but this got me around. And then as soon as I was aligned, I went into uh, barriers. And then I had to do a little bit of track and capture. It uh, wasn't too bad. Uh, actually, Dan uh, makes my job very easy. And at this point, uh, we were extremely happy because uh, we had a good grapple and uh, we were uh, ready to continue on. Uh, at this point, uh, it doesn't show up anywhere in the, the video or anything, but uh, Wexby took over and manually uh, flew to the protect attitude and maintained that attitude throughout the photo survey. And uh, Marcia took uh, more photos than uh, I'm clear to tell you, but she'll tell you in her film report tonight. Uh, and I think uh, that that'll all go well towards uh, documenting and uh, helping with the data that uh, they hope to get off LDF. Columbia Houston, we have a message for you from the administrator, if you're ready. We're ready. Today, as you flawlessly executed the LDEF retrieval, literally millions paused from their daily routines and quietly watched America's space program at its very best. Thanks for providing us earthbound folks with such an inspiring start for the 1990s. Signed, Vice Admiral Richard Truly, Administrator. Hello, LDEP, well, hello, LDEP. It's so nice to have you back where you belong. You're looking swell, LDEP, we can tell. LDEP, you're still glowing, you're still growing, you're still going strong. We... Good morning, Columbia. Your music this morning is courtesy of the LDEF Project, who are obviously very happy today. All right, you guys. They're done now. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. The gooey, gushy, squishy, mossy, rotten through the core. The standing outside your door. We're getting good downlink. We think. Well, that uh, I guess answers the Dallas question. For uh, we uh, pulled up on LDEF uh, yesterday, and we it was a little blurry. We had to put a special filter on, but uh, we saw something uh, that was kind of strange, so we got it on the cam recorder, and uh, we thought we'd uh, show it to you. So it's uh, probably the first in a long line of experiments with the tomatoes that have been on LDEF. Okay, that's great. And we're just crossing the Andes and uh, about to come into a bunch of clouds, but uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's some real interesting geology down in the mountains in this part of the world. And, uh... We're getting a great view, Dan. Thanks. This machine is the American Flight Echocardiogram. It's an off-the-shelf ultrasonic imaging system. That uh, it's a standard piece of equipment that's used to get a non-invasive picture of the heart and other other soft tissue. And it's handy. He's got the uh, transduce, transducer that does the ultrasonic imaging, and we're putting a gel on it, which is sort of goopy water, um, and that that gives us a better picture. The way the ultrasound works is that the ultrasound waves will basically bounce off different structure uh, with different different densities in it, and that's how we see a picture of the heart. What we're doing with this experiment is measuring the cardiovascular changes that microgravity causes on the body. This uh, data was taken on a pre-flight, it'll be done post-flight, and then we're gathering the data in flight, and so they can measure the, the different sizes of the chambers of the heart and tell what zero-g does to us. Jim, the, uh, the bread mold looks like it's made for 
even bands, and on the past two days, almost all of them have gone damp. Uh, it looks like the growth is about two-thirds of the way down the tube on almost all of the white ones. We're going to take some photographs, and then if you have nothing else, we'll go on to the red package. Marsha, we copy. Thank you. Those are the fires they're looking for on the deforestation? Yeah, they're in there. Columbia, Houston, we have some real-time downlink of your water dump. Looks great. Quite a show, isn't it? You bet. Pretty amazing, isn't it? It's incredible. Hold me in place, man. Okay. I'm going to move this hand. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. I got it. Okay. Frank just said a <laughs> This is great. Look at this. Yeah, we got that. Okay, Houston, what, we, uh, what you can see here is the lower body negative pressure device, um, or LBNP as we've been calling it here. Um, what this is is a candidate reconditioning protocol that... Uh, we hope might be able to, use, to be used for uh, overcoming or, or bettering orthostatic intolerance. Orthostatic intolerance in, in one gravity is the um, inability to stand up without feeling dizzy or lightheaded or even in the worst case um, passing out or, or um, fainting. Okay, so what we've got here is uh, the lower body negative pressure device. The last time uh, we flew one of these in the U.S. space program was uh, on a Skylab mission. In fact, we flew it uh, on all three of the Skylab missions. It looked a little bit different from this. In fact, it was a, uh, a solid can um, that we flew. In this case, this entire device and all the equipment that you see right here can be folded up and, and put into one of our lockers here. What we're doing here is um, at uh, the same time that, that Bonnie has a lower body, uh, a lower pressure on her uh, lower body right now, Marcia is um, using the American flight echocardiograph and taking some pictures of her heart. Now the measurements that we take while we're doing this, uh, we are constantly measuring uh, blood pressure, heart rate, and EKG. Um, and in fact, uh, EKG and heart rate are being constantly downlinked to the ground. Blood pressure is the only one, uh, up here we're the only ones that have the, the blood pressure. We're monitoring that on this automatic blood pressure device, and it's also being taped down here on a recorder. Um, right now we've only got, we, when we come out of this mission, we are only going to have uh, two data points, which really isn't enough to draw any conclusions from, but um, we'll be able to measure Bonnie's and my heart rate, blood pressure, and EKG when we return uh, to Edwards in a few days um, and see if uh, we think there was any effect from this. But more importantly, when we fly this on some more shuttle flights and also, uh, you know, if we have any iterations, that any suggestions that we might be able to make to this, iterations between this and, and the ground-based studies, uh, um, hopefully uh, in the future we'll be able to come up with a, a, a fairly good uh, or maybe uh, even a more effective countermeasure to orthostatic intolerance. Dave, we copy all that. Um, we appreciate the brief on LBNP. You all look great up there. All right, Jamie, thanks. Hi, Dan. This is Larry Bird. Congratulations to you and the crew on the slam dunk with LDF. Happy birthday and have a safe landing. Happy birthday.
Good morning, Columbia, and a happy birthday to Danny Boy. I was hoping that uh, flying Mach 25, you didn't age, and this this wasn't going to happen this year. No, that's not the way it works. You already heard birthday greetings from the astronaut office and from Larry Bird during the wake-up music, but the LDF team and all the rest of us here in MCC wanted to wish you a happy birthday too, Dan. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So, how old are you anyway? Didn't you know this is a classified mission? It's a pleasure to bring you back aboard Columbia again. Uh, what we'd like to do today is uh, give you a demonstration of uh, some of the equipment we have on board the shuttle. I know you're all uh, very aware of the many pictures uh, that uh, people see coming down from the shuttle in real time and also the photographs uh, that are brought back. Uh, the photo documentation on board these shuttle missions uh, is done with a variety of photographic equipment. And the purpose of the uh, documentation is uh, for uh, Earth observations, for technical documentation of various uh, experiments and payloads, and some of it uh, is just pure aesthetics uh, to demonstrate and show people uh, of America that support our space program how beautiful uh, this uh, universe is that we live on. So with uh, that uh, in mind, I'd like to introduce uh, Marsha Ivins, who's going to uh, show you uh, and demonstrate some of the things we do with the 70 millimeter camera, and here's Marsha. millimeter camera that we use for mostly Earth observations is a Hasselblad. It's a standard Hasselblad that's pretty much not modified for our use. It has a motor drive on it, and it has a data magazine. The data mag holds about 95 or 100 frames of film, and it has a, uh, a uh, data on the back that basically tells us the MET of what we're shooting. For some film tests that we're flying, I have some regular rolls of 120 film, which is what a Hasselblad normally uses, and I have the, uh, the uh, little backs for that so that I can compare this to other types of film. In order to do that, I use this device, which has got two cameras on the same, two cameras on one bracket, and they're connected to a button. When I hit one button, I fire both cameras at the same time. We fly three different lenses on this camera, a 50, a 100, and a 250, and in this case I have two 250s. I can line this up in the window and shoot the scenes, compare two films, and compare two speeds, compare two different f-stops. One of the things we're doing on this flight is to look at long lenses, and so I have yet even a bigger lens. This is a 500 millimeter lens for the Hasselblad, and we'll be comparing this to a long lens for the, the uh, 35 millimeter camera also and seeing how well we do looking at that. This camera is not an automatic camera. It requires that you determine what your own exposure is, and so our spot gives us an exposure, but we also use a spot meter looking out the window to average the scene and uh, decide what exposure to use. That's about it for the 70s. The 35 will be Weatherby. millimeter camera uh, that most folks have at home. We use it here on board the shuttle for documenting crew actions and taking still photography of some of the uh, mid-deck experiments that we're accomplishing and also some uh, action out in the payload bay or, uh, for example, LDAP in our case and, uh, and Earth observation photography. We use on this camera various uh, different lenses ranging all the way from Uh, fisheye lens uh, for documenting action in the, in the mid-deck uh, when you need to have a, a wide field of view, and, and it's the standard uh, photograph that you see that's slightly distorted out on the side. 
Uh, one of our favorites, uh, 3570 Zoom, for taking uh, Earth observations. You can frame the picture uh, pretty nicely with that. And all the way up to my favorite, the 300 millimeter lens. We're uh, using uh, this lens to compare it with the uh, 70 millimeter photography that Marcia is taking. Some of the features on, on this camera, of course, the standard uh, flash that we use. Uh, it has an automatic feature, so you don't have to worry about any times or setting the lights or, or taking meter readings down in the, in the mid deck. It's automatic, and you just uh, view it and shoot. We have a data back on the on the back of the camera that automatically prints the MET on the on the photograph, uh, useful for Earth observations, so we can locate uh, the the picture that we've taken. And of course, my favorite, the motor drive. You just point, shoot, and it rewinds, and you're ready for the next shot. Dave is next, and he'll be talking about the Airy camera. What we've got here is a 16 millimeter Aeroflex motion picture camera. Um, this is actually an identical camera to a camera that's used widely in the motion picture industry. On uh, board, we use it to document uh, almost all the activities that we do here. In fact, most of the uh, films that we take when we go talking uh, throughout the country about our space flights are taken with this camera here. What, uh, we've got two different kinds of lenses here. What we've got on here right now is the uh, uh, 10 to 100 millimeter lens. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it's also got an, an auto feature to it that will take care of your f-stops for you. So all you have to do is uh, point, focus, and then shoot. The camera is battery powered, and this is the battery pack right here. It's got uh, 16 millimeter magazines right here. We carry about 12 of these on board with us, and it can be these magazines can be daylight loaded. So the camera itself is just this portion here that you're seeing. Bonnie Dunbar is going to talk about the CCTV system that we have on board. I'm going to talk a little bit about our video systems or what we call our cir closed circuit TV. We have both interior and exterior cameras. Most of the video that came down during the rendezvous and capture of LDAP was exterior video. The payload bay is a rectangle, and at each corner there is a, a camera. Normally we can carry both color and black and white and wide angle and standard view lenses. Uh, I'm going to take a, a moment here and show you some of them. I'm going to downlink first uh, what we call camera B, which is in the forward right side of the uh, shuttle payload bay, and it's looking at the aft side of the shuttle, LDEF, uh, over at the right-hand side. And if you look closely, you can see uh, camera C down there on the aft bulkhead. Going back over to camera A, which is on the forward left or port side of the uh, vehicle, you can uh, maybe make out camera B, or Bravo, down at the aft bulkhead, but you also see the remote manipulator system off to your right. We use this to capture the LDF, and it also has two camera systems on it. It has a camera on the elbow, which is a color wide angle lens, and then it has a camera right where the uh, arm grapples onto the payload, which is called the end effector. And we use that camera on board to actually fly the end effector like an airplane. Our controllers on board have uh, roll pitch and yaw and translation axes, and we look at a TV monitor inside. Coming back inside, you can see the uh, two TV monitors that we use. And during the uh, grapple of LDAP, I couldn't see very well out the windows exactly what I was grappling onto. In fact, I was using primarily these TV monitors to look at what I had to do. Uh, we control all of the shuttle clo closed circuitry TV from this panel right here where we can select the television uh, camera that we want to use and where we want it to go. We can also power it on and off. 
Uh, recently on several shuttle flights, we have been evaluating uh, off-the-shelf uh, camcorders, and we have one here, several different models. We found these uh, very useful for in-cabin photography and for uh, experimental documentation. In fact, they've been so successful that we have at least two experiments on this flight that utilize uh, off-the-shelf camcorders uh, in, and macro lenses for documenting experimental results. Well, this gives you kind of a quick view of the video systems that we have on board, and uh, we'd definitely like to thank all the people who uh, helped support us in doing this. And now I'll get you back to Dan. Well, the last camera system we have on board is probably the, the granddaddy of all cameras, and uh, it uh, should be coming into the view right here. And that's a very large format camera. It's uh, called IMAX. Uh, it's uh, actually a payload. Uh, it flies on uh, specific uh, shuttle missions and has uh, documented The Dream is Alive as one of the movies. It's shown in uh, several... Uh, theaters, I think there are about 100 theaters worldwide, uh, very special theaters that uh, only show this format. The, uh, the format of each frame is 70 millimeters uh, high by 120 long, and it gives a very high fidelity picture. As you can see, it's a, a very large camera, and uh, it's not uh, something you, you use uh, in the spur of the moment. You pretty well have to plan your shots ahead of time. You can see I'm holding it by some hand holes, which allow you to maneuver it like that. And we also, uh, to get the best shots that are most stabilized, we have a, a rig where we can mount it at the window right over here, and it takes a shot looking right at the earth. So using it this way, it's uh, very stabilized, and uh, we get uh, some very good pictures. Uh, all in all, as you can see, we have a, a wide variety of uh, cameras on board. A couple things I think uh, worth noting uh, that uh, Marsha alluded to in the 70 millimeter that we were running some tests. Uh, we've uh, normally uh, used only one or two types of film, and on this uh, flight we have a great number of films that we're doing the side-by-side -side comparison, hopefully uh, to enhance uh, the uh, phot photography and uh, get better pictures uh, in the future. Well, once again, these uh, photographs are used for a wide variety of things. Uh, for instance, on the LDF retrieve to document uh, the various uh, experiments before uh, it even re-enters uh, in the shuttle and uh, gets maybe bounced around a little bit when we uh, land. It, uh, Marsha took over 70, 700 photographs uh, with the 70 millimeter to document each individual tray on the LDF. So quite a bit of technical data are uh, collected on the, the, the photographs and the uh, tapes and the uh, movies we take, in addition to the uh, other uh, around uh, life on the shuttle as we're doing right now. And uh, with that, uh, hopefully this will uh, lend a little insight into some of the equipment we have on board the shuttle. And uh, we'd like to turn the cameras back to the ground, who also can control the TV cameras, and uh, they can uh, look at some Earth uh, views. Thanks a lot. Dan, thank you for an informative presentation. I'm, I'm filming this right now. Although everyone calls it zero G, it really isn't quite zero G. And sometimes we do get down to micro G, but normally we're about one one hundredth to one one hundred thousandth of a G. And it turns out that can be a very important variable, not only in certain systems, but certain processes. NASA got involved in that research um, during the uh, Gemini and Apollo days and trying to determine how they would get their liquid propellant through the tank and out to the engine. And out of that grew a new understanding of how fluids reacted in a weightless or near zero G environment. I think everybody has demonstrated with the orange juice, and I'll be no exception, fluids respond differently in a zero G environment.
Well, you can see they react differently. Uh, fluids don't break apart like a, they do from a hose. Uh, they uh, are controlled by something called the Rayleigh limit. You can't draw a column of a fluid uh, longer than uh, its diameter. And all these are important things to understand because they could become obscured by gravity. It's also important in materials processing because on the Earth uh, we can't change G. We can do some free fall experiments for 30 seconds in a zero G aircraft, or we can use drop towers and get a few seconds of uh, microgravity. But the only real place to understand how G uh, affects uh, everything from crystallization to separation processes is here in the, the laboratory at space. What we're trying to understand in this experiment is uh, not so much how G affects some of the crystallization processes themselves, but sometimes how random disturbances affect them, uh, particularly when you're in an environment such as the shuttle or the space station. Uh, the large uh, white and black object over it is the heater. And on either side of that, you can see the undulating zone. What was particularly remarkable about this, uh, all of these samples, indium, is that we had put stride lines on the indium so we could tell how far the molten zone had traveled when we were heating up the sample. Well, as you can see, the molten zones, or the stride lines on the surface did not disappear. And this is uh, very interesting. It may mean that we've got a, a skin of some kind, an indium compound, or, or something else. But this explains why it is often very difficult to determine where the zone is on indium. The other thing you will notice is that all this, so this is located on the aft flight deck and connected to a um, what would be on the ground a vertical wall with the shuttle on, on a landing position. The undulations themselves respond directly to the undulations of the treadmill on the Lyo door. Uh, we hope that uh, this data will be of use to space stations and to other manned laboratories that we can learn how to isolate our exercise equipment. Uh, we the uh, like I think many people would like to think that we could one day automate all of this, but I think we're in a very embryonic research stage. And we've got a good view of Wixby running on the treadmill now. Thanks a lot. Columbia Houston, he's looking real strong, but he's smiling, so he needs to run faster. This is his, just his warm-up. He wanted to know, or let the dogs know that after this warm-up, he'd put on all of his instrumentation and do it uh, again. Two and I three. Up. Doesn't look like anybody's rolling in there. Slide. So our three has bubbles and our four has bubbles.
looking at graphics uh, generated by uh, systems at uh, the Gold Room at Dryden. Uh, Columbia's energy and navigation are all in good shape. Uh, descending at a rate of uh, 350 feet per second. They're at about 53,000 feet. They're uh, approaching the uh, intersection with a heading alignment circle and will be making a left overhead turn to line up for the approach to concrete runway 22. Xenon lights illuminating the uh, approach end of the runway at Edwards. Columbia will come into our field of view when we have this camera up uh, to the right of the frame and we'll roll out Columbia to the left. Houston, you're looking good approaching the heck. We'd like a state vector transfer to the BFS. Surface winds are 260 at 5, altimeter 3011. Roger. This view again from an infrared camera at Edwards and we see Columbia making the left overhead turn. They are now about ten and a half nautical miles out, altitude 15,000 feet. Touchdown, uh, one minute, 56 seconds. Flight Dynamics Officer Ed Gonzalez reports they look real good, They're rolling on the final. Columbia is now processing the microwave landing system. Now a minute 40 to touchdown. Velocity uh, or altitude 11,000 feet, range 7.2 nautical mile. Columbia, we see an odd glide slope converging to center line. Range now five nautical miles, altitude 5,600 feet. Gear down. Columbia rolls out uh, after a successful flight. This view from an infrared camera again, and of course uh, those uh, images in uh, lighter co colors are uh, brighter and hotter. Roger, Columbia. Welcome home. Outstanding job. You showed us the shuttle at its best, deploying and retrieving satellites. Great way to start the decade. Stand by for your post-landing deltas.
I'll go to closed and back to GPC. This is Mission Control Houston, the crew of uh, STS-32, now departing from the Space Shuttle Columbia. Bonnie Dunbar. Him, uh, Commander Dan Brandenstein. Crew members now boarding the Astro van and here in the Mission Control Center, the uh, MCC has officially handed over to the convoy team and uh, the plaque hanging ceremony about to begin here in Mission Control as the crew members board the Astro van at uh, Dryden. <laughs> 